Hello, my name is Anne Varty. I'm a lecturer in the English department at Royal Holloway and I'm a specialist in Victorian literature and theatre and in poetry by women through the 20th century and into the 21st century. Today I'm going to talk about Scars Upon My Heart, which is an anthology of First World War poetry written by women and edited by Catherine Riley. I'm going to consider the the anthology under broadly five headings. The first is I want to talk about the place of this anthology amongst other anthologies of World War poetry, World War I poetry. Um, then I want to talk about what this edition actually offers the reader. Then I want to talk about the arguments about women's right to speak, to be heard on this topic. Fourth, to consider stereotypes of women during wartime and the extent to which this anthology upholds or challenges those. And finally, I want to consider two different approaches to studying this text. So to begin with my first area, what is the place of this anthology amongst other anthologies of World War I poetry? Well, it's an absolutely pioneering text it was published in 1981 by Virago, but edited by an extraordinary bibliographer called Catherine Riley, and she compiled uh, the most comprehensive bibliography of British poetry of the First World War, which she published in 1978. In the course of making that bibliographical work, she discovered that there were about roughly 2,000 World War I poets, of which over 500 were women. And she obviously realised that these women were not published, they just weren't known about in the 1970s. Um, so her anthology is very much a correction to that complete vanishing of these women's voices. Now, the book itself, the anthology itself, was published by Virago, um, which was a very important women's press, feminist press, that was founded by Carmen Khalil. And it was very important for uh, what's known as canon reformation, um, bringing forgotten works by women back into print and making them available for readers in the 1980s. 1970s, 1980s. Even so, when it first came out in the newspapers, it was reviewed by Lorna Sage, very important critic and writer, um, uh, in the 1980s, uh, under the headline, Blighty in a Nighty. Uh, so again, there's a sense that women's uh, poetry on this topic is diminished by humour, simply by not taking it seriously. Um, but again, to provide a, a bit more context about how this, how Scars Upon My Heart figures now amongst anthologies of First World War poetry and to suggest ways in which these anthologies uh, can help to open up and present avenues for further study of Scars Upon My Heart, um, I want to just look at a, a couple of contemporary editions. Um, We've got the Penguin Book of First World War Poetry here. This is uh, first published in 2004. So just to think about how anthologies organise themselves, this is organised thematically. So we get um, Into the Battlefield, uh, The Aftermath, Peace, so on. Um, so it's a, it's all the poems are, are grouped thematically. There are a number of women in this anthology. They are all women who were published in Scars Upon My Heart. So it's been, Riley's work has been absolutely seminal and foundational in dictating the women whose work is now published, republished in anthologies. So we've got the Penguin book, which is um, thematically organized. 2003, Andrew Motion's selection of First World War poetry is not thematically organised, it's chronologically organised to tell the story of the First World War, but without a narrative voice. So 
uh, Andrew Motion has selected the poems to, you know, tell the story from 1914 through to 1918 uh, in their own voices. Um, again, there are women in this anthology, all selected from Scars Upon My Heart. More recently, I think 2012, we've got Tim Kendall's edition of Poetry of the First World War. He's also done a chronological arrangement, uh, but he has arranged um, the poems chronologically by the date of birth of the poet. Um, so it's not a narrative of the war, it's a chronology of the life of the poet. And um, each poet is introduced with a biographical note, so there's quite a suggested context for each poet. The last anthology I want to consider here is called Beneath Troubled Skies. It's an anthology of Scottish poems about the First World War. This has yet another way of arranging its material. The poems are arranged by year of publication through the war and each year is prefaced with a historical note about what the main historical events in the war of that year were and then the poems follow and then we go on to the next year. So these uh, anthologies can suggest ways in which we might uh, begin to investigate Scars Upon My Heart. Riley of course prints her 79 poets in alphabetical order by last name. That therefore does not provide any kind of um, historical chronology of the war, how these poems fitted into the events that were taking place and what they were writing in response to. Providing a chronology of how these poems fit into the political events of the period would be a potentially a rewarding way of investigating. Um, also getting a sense of how these poems fit into the lives of the women who uh, were writing them could be another way in. Um, and that, I think, brings me to um, my second broad area. What does this edition actually offer us? So we have the editor's preface, which gives a brief uh, re rationale for why she published it. But then we also have... Um, a preface by a poet called Judith Kazantzis, who was a well-known poet at the time. So she writes the uh, introduction, a more considered piece of reflection about the material. And then we also have the textual uh, acknowledgements where Riley found this material. That's a very useful uh, place to look for chronologies and sources. I think one of the interesting things that emerged from studying that uh, scholarly detail is the fact that many of these poems came from newspapers and journals and other anthologies of war poetry, so one gets a wider sense of where these women were publishing and a much wider sense of how poetry was integrated in the cultural life of Britain during those war years. And then finally, at the end of the, the, the volume, we have the very short biographical notices about each poet. Um, and that is uh, extraordinary, in fact, to see if you read those carefully, how extraordinary many of these women were. Or if they weren't extraordinary, they were extraordinary because they were ordinary, because they reflected ordinary, everyday experience. So. The, uh, the biographies are a very rich source of information as well for unpacking the texts. One of the main uh, responses that one gets even today, if you say, oh, I'm working on World War I poetry by women, is people say, oh, I didn't know there was any. Um, it, it's still a response. So that, you know, a quarter of the poets were women, uh, we still don't know who they are. And the assumption when people say, oh, I didn't know there was any, is that, mm, but women didn't fight, they weren't in the trenches, how could they possibly have written war poetry? So the narrative that we inherit, that our culture inherits in a popular way, of the soldier poets being uh, the war poets, those who have the authority to speak about the war, is still very strong and very difficult to shake. Um, but these women all wrote with a sense that they did have a right to speak and that their poetry was as relevant to the war experience as 
the poetry by the men who were fighting at the front. The debate about whether women had a right to speak, whether women's poetry can be considered war poetry at all, is an important aspect to the study of this material. Um, I think a, a, a classic article on the topic is by James Campbell, published in 1999, called Combat Gnosticism. And it, it, what he looks at is whether, the, whether it's legitimate for the literary critics to uphold the narrative that only people fighting in the trenches had authority, had special access to experience and had the authority to write about that experience. And I think Campbell's argument is, you know, does away with that sense that there is a, a, there's only one set of privileged um, authorities about this experience. And there is a plural, plurality of experience that is worthy of our attention and that has authority. So women do have a right to speak about the war. There is no question about that now, both in a scholarly sense and a historical sense and in an aesthetic sense. We can think about stereotypes of women in wartime Obviously, this uh, women do not yet have the vote. So they're all lacking full citizenship and inheriting many of the stereotypes of the Victorian era um, when it was expected in very, very broad brush stereotypical terms that men should bear arms, women should bear children, uh, that the two spheres of experience between men and women are radically separate and distinct and that women are creatures of the home, they're domestic, they're guardian of the nation's morals, they uphold um, standards of virtue, and they must be protected, uh, because protecting a woman is tantamount to protecting a nation, to protecting everything that is cherished and held dear. These stereotypes are, of course, challenged by many of the women in, in, in this anthology, but they're also upheld um, so I think that's a question to pursue in studying the text. Finally, I wanted to talk about a couple of suggested areas or suggested means of studying the text. There are potentially two very obvious areas and they are either to look for shared themes or to study the work of individual poets. Obviously, the shared themes approach uh, in a sense, it replicates the Penguin Book of War Poetry, First World War Poetry, insofar as that was arranged thematically. Um, there are many shared themes and shared approaches. I think, for me, one of the ones that stands out uh, most readily is the, um, the conflict, the contrast between nature and war. That dichotomy or that binary opposition seems to me to play through uh, a great many of these poems. Another one of them, dominant, is the idea of frontline experience, which is not necessarily combat experience, it has to be non-combatant experience, but nevertheless working in a kitchen, in a munitions factory, in a hospital, in a canteen, a military canteen. So there's that kind of uh, authority of experience. Alternatively, there's the domestic experience, bringing up children, addressing children, explaining absence. There's mourning and there's bereavement. The only other anthology of women's poetry of the First World War that I know that's exclusively devoted to women uh, was published in 1994 by a scholar called no Noshin Khan and she has arranged her material thematically. Um, so a thematic approach is, is, has got scholarly pedigree and then finally, the uh, alternative approach to studying this text could be to look at the individual poets. There are many extraordinary women, as I've suggested, but just to sort of fan out extremes, if you like, we've got Cicely Hamilton, her poem, Non-Combatant, which is um, a poem about not being, not being allowed to fight because she's a woman. She was a, a very... Uh, confirmed suffragist. She's a well-known activist for the suffrage movement, uh, particularly as a playwright. Um, so it's interesting to put her poetry alongside her dramatic work. Complete other extreme, we've got Margaret Sackville, 
second cousin to Vita Sackville West. Margaret Sackville was a confirmed pacifist and she wrote pacifist poetry. She was absolutely against any kind of military combat. For example, Jessie Pope, who is one of the few women in this anthology who was a professional writer who lived entirely by her pen and was very popular. So she steers, she's writing for a popular market and she's always completely in tune with the dominant political mood of the country. Um, 